Hi, I'm Deborah Holchis, editor of Michigan Today. In this episode, my guest is Jim Tobin, a longtime writer for Michigan Today, who's back in the fold after more than a year of COVID-19 budget restraints. Here's even more good news. Jim has just released a new book about the history of your favorite university called Sing to the Colors, a writer explores two centuries at the University of Michigan. If you know Jim's writing, you can be assured this is not some dry tome listing dates and dusty details of days gone by. One of his greatest talents is taking a historic event or significant development and telling it through the experience of a person, an actual human you might find interesting. So a story about the trees on the Diag becomes the tale of one professor's heartbreak over U of M students lost to the Civil War. A well-known story about three professors who are ousted during the communist scare gets a new read when Jim finds a fourth professor, way more interesting than the other three, who received minimal coverage at the time. His essay on the now defunct and controversial senior honor society Michigama doesn't just describe the society's racist underpinnings, it becomes a personal reflection about when Jim found a photo of his father dressed as the chief of that very society when he was a U of M student. Jim enriches these essays by including himself in short introductions that illuminate his connection to his beloved alma mater and the subjects he covers. So I hope you enjoy these musings by Michigan Today's favorite son. We kick off our conversation by talking about college in general, the scholarly mission today, and why those of us who work in academia often are described as lefties. He's got some interesting insights into our culture's latest fixation with anti-intellectualism. That's a plague that's long been visited on U of M. Oh, but who am I kidding, man? I admire Jim, and it's just plain fun to talk to him about the craft of storytelling. Here's Jim. The complexity of the world has become more clear to more of us with the coming of the web over the last 20 and 25 years. We are so bombarded with complexity that I think maybe we grasp at simple answers. It's easier to believe in QAnon than it is to think the world is a really complicated place and things I don't like have really complicated causes. I mean, you know, one argument is that conservatives value the way things have been um, and they are skeptical of radical change because they think that radical change often destroys more than it should. So that means that conservatives sort of tend to stand for the status quo. Well, scholars are by their nature people who are looking into the way things are questioning questioning authority all those are 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 good things yeah well does that make them leftists not exactly it makes them contrarians so i think i think sometimes members of the public looking in at the university from the outside see a a contrarian side and and they they brand that as major leftism it's, it's, it's not quite, it's more complicated than that. I remember a story told about Lee Bollinger, the former dean of the law school and president of the university, giving a lecture and engaging in a kind of Socratic dialogue with a student where the student is, is trying to defend a point that he's making and, and Bollinger keeps asking one question after another. And finally, after 20 minutes, the student kind of stops and says, well, it's complicated. And Bollinger says, Mr. Smith, that's the only point I wanted you to make. <laughs> and, you know, that's, that's the nature of, you know, sort of scholarly inquiry. Things are more complicated than they seem. We reject simple, simple explanations, simple answers. We look deeply. To some people, that looks just, that looks like constant leftism, but that's not quite what it is. It's not. It's not what it is. We have a great degree of disillusionment in our society right now with institutions in general. And God knows institutions have have done badly in in American life in many ways. On the other hand, they make up the structure of what people used to call our civilization. Yes, they are flawed because they are made up simply of a bunch of human beings who are also flawed and people are flawed in the way they get along with each other. But look at the amazing work that has been done in a place like the University of Michigan. And that is because, you know, the founders and the people who perpetuated it and improved it made this network of human relationships bound together by common purposes. It's really extraordinary. 
uh, we so take it for granted, but an institution like Lake Michigan is really one of the crown and glories of, of this society and others like it that have valued education. Be enlarged and enriched by everything, for you are the sons and daughters of Michigan, and you have everything it takes to be the hope of the world. And in, in fact, you know, one of the stories in the book about the first real president of Michigan, Henry Philip Tappan, is, is about how anti-intellectuals in the state and even on the Board of Regents sort of got tired of his rather esoteric vision, what was then esoteric uh, vision for the university and what it would be, and got rid of him. He was overthrown by that sentiment in the populace. It goes back as far as that. And, and you know we've seen plenty of anti-intellectualism in the 20th century, and so it continues now. And, and maybe there's a pendulum that goes back and forth. I do think that we're in a new era of constant distraction because of the web and especially because of smartphones. But I do believe that, that stories are gonna play a role in bringing people back to concentrated attention. However difficult scholarly analysis may be, if you can make it into a story, you're going to win people back. You're going to, going to win students back. You're going to win readers back. Yeah. There's enormous appetite in our culture for stories I mean, throughout the world. Who cares about the history of the University of Michigan, right? Well, actually, <laughs> if you can make it into a story, you just might get people to read. And take the field. I've been lucky enough to live in Ann Arbor ever since I graduated from the university. But many alumni have those feelings of bondedness to this place where they were young. Mm -hmm. And I don't think we think about that enough, the, the kind of the role of college experience in, the, in, in our lives as adults. There really is, for all its faults, a sense of community, a sense of place that gets associated with starting your life in a learned environment. Now, God knows, a great many of us as college students never did take full advantage of what the university offered to us. And of course, now it has gotten so terribly expensive for, for students to go to school. But that's not the university's fault. That's the fault of, of our states, which have cut and cut and cut the investment in public higher education. So that's why tuition is so high, mm -hmm. um, because for many, many years, the state has reduced its appropriations. Once upon a time, it was not terribly difficult for students to be able to afford to go to the University of Michigan. And they did. It was a pretty, it was a good bargain for the state. And uh, it was, it was a good bargain for students and their families. That sense of, of a campus as, as a special place grew and students became attached to that place. And as I think the, the book points out, the students had a great deal to do with creating the culture of campus life. And that's what so many students, so many alumni, you know, now remember so fondly. The really warm feelings they have tend to be toward the culture of the place, the culture of the campus, and the physical nature of the place, the way the buildings look, the way the streets are laid out, the, the, the walks that you took off campus. And, and that's totally associated with coming of age, right? The great, the, one of the, the major dramas of all of our lives, wherever it takes place, is to pass from childhood to adulthood. And for so many, you know, Americans, especially now in the post-World War II era, that transition has taken place on a college campus. So naturally, we have powerful feelings of attachment and allegiance to that place. The right faculty can have an enormous impact on people's lives. For, for me, it was the historian uh, Sidney Fine, as well as other historians I could name, Gerald Linderman for one, and the history department, Shaw Livermore. The best example in the book is, is my profile of Yale Kamisar in, in the law school. I quote one of his colleagues, a law professor named Hart Wright, who was a professor of tax law and a, a brilliant person, somebody who was so learned about American tax law that people from the IRS would come and like ask him questions, you know, like about the about the whole structure of tax law. Hart Wright was once asked, why, when you could have been a millionaire tax attorney, why did you choose to be a law professor instead? And he sort of shrugged his shoulders and said, well, I like to profess. 
Now, I, I, I talk a little bit um, in that piece about what the word profess and to be a professor means uh, traditionally. It's not just a, an instructor. It's someone who sort of embodies his or her discipline. The, a, a really great professor, whether it's in a lab or in a lecture or in a discussion or in a seminar, embodies the values of learning. So, I mean, that's one thing. And then, and then another is the actual research that, that they do. And, and you're right. Most undergraduates don't really understand what their professors do in the time that, that, that they give to research. We live with a lot of myths about that. The publisher perish syndrome, uh, the view that scholarly research doesn't really affect anything or help anybody unless you're in very practical fields like engineering. But the fact is that those professors are, are adding every day to the body of our understanding of the whole world and in, in their various disciplines. So somebody like Kamisar, it turned out because the sources on Kamisar's career are so rich, he was a great, um, I think, person to represent that whole story. Here's what he did in his career, his illustrious career, the enormous impact that he had on students, but also the enormous impact that he had on American law. Have you no sense of decency, sir, at long last? Have you left no sense of decency? So in the, in the 50s, three members of the faculty, Davis, Markert, and Nickerson, were basically fired because they had had ties to the Communist Party or had been members of the Communist Party years before. This was a celebrated incident. So I start to look into it and then I realized there was a fourth figure who lost his position and nobody knows about him. And he was by far sort of the most prestigious or the, you know, the most accomplished of the group. His name was Lawrence Klein, he was an economist and he had been a, a communist uh, in his student days uh, before World War II, before probably, and probably still during World War II, and then had become increasingly involved in his own research and scholarship, which was amazingly important. He was one of the pioneers of what we now call econometrics, the application of statistical models mm -hmm. to economics. So Michigan grabbed him, and this fact about his past became known. And so the administration started to in investigate him. The FBI had looked into him. And it was clear that he was not a member of the Communist Party, was not subversive in any way, not a revolutionary, wasn't secretly indoctrinating students with Marxist principles. But uh, there was one member of the faculty, also an economist, uh, who was an anti-Semite and uh, decided that Lawrence Klein was uh, a great villain and mounted a steady campaign to get rid of him and did so. None of that made the headlines. So when that story, when I sort of traced that story deep in the archives at the Bentley Library, I thought, wow, this is the story to tell that I, I you know, I, it's like Eureka, you know, this is the big deal. Lawrence Klein incidentally went on to teach at the Wharton School of Economics and won the Nobel Prize. Well, that's a Nobel Prize winner that, that Michigan lost uh, because of its own short-sightedness. <laughs> Mishigama, now a word not known to the vast majority of Michigan students, was once a very prestigious senior honorary society that had a Native American theme, started very early in the 20th century, and uh, imitated older fraternal organizations that imitated Indians, played Indian as the term is, and appropriated kind of pop culture ideas about what American Indians stood for. Went on for many years, was very popular and well thought of. It engaged in every spring these, these public hazing rituals when it initiated new members. And then in the 60s and then especially in the 70s, it became more and more controversial. They admitted only men. And then by the year 2000, uh, Native American students and their allies took over the tower of the Michigan Union to protest the, the role of Michigan on, on the campus, even though Michigan had just decided to admit women and had almost entirely discarded any use of Native American associations, except its name, Michigan, which was supposedly the, the name of 
of a Native American tribe in, in Michigan. There actually was no such tribe anyway. <laughs> So it, it was reconstituted in, in 2006 with a new mission, a highly multicultural purpose, admitted students of, of, of all sort of sexual orientation and gender from across the campus and lasted for about 15 years and, and then was finally disbanded by the current group early this year in 2021. So that's the whole saga of 100. 20 years. My father was a member in, in 1940, 41, in fact, was the so-called sachem or chief of the tribe. And then I was briefly a member in the 1970s, but I quit after just a week or two because I just decided it wasn't for me, not because I was any great reforming figure. So I wrote about this and, and about the complicated feelings that it, that it brought up for me as I was watching the movement against Confederate statuary, as I watched coverage of white people using blackface. And so this piece emerged. How should I think about, especially my dad's role in this organization that many people would now say was racist or at least guilty of cultural appropriation? How should I feel about my own brief involvement? Um, so that's what that essay about. That's one of the, it's one of two essays in the book that had not been published before. That's a way to start that conversation. Um, but it doesn't finish the conversation. Certainly the daily from practically the first week I arrived was the center of my life as an undergraduate. That's my most important Michigan experience. The best thing you can do in college is to find a way to make something with friends of yours. It might be in theater, it might be in music, it might be in sports, it might be in the publications. But that's the really exhilarating work that you can do in college. There's a lesson in that for college faculty too. Make your own courses as much like that experience as you possibly can. From Ann Arbor, a barn burner, call it what you will. Why to the right is Bow Rather? It's Taylor Deep and I would always have said, I, you know, I loved I loved my time at Michigan, and I have a lot of affection for the place. But as I put these together, I, I realized. Well, this is this is the story of your own life that you're that you're writing here. It's not about you. It's about all these other subjects, but the subjects show your own preoccupations, your own interests. I mean, the story of the the Negro Caucasian Club mm -hmm. in the 1920s. Now, why did I have such a strong connection? I'm not sure, except that that I, I think it allowed me to write about the experience of African Americans. At, at the university in a way that wasn't usually done. Mostly that history is told in terms of athletics because so many of the well-known black students of Michigan have been athletes. And so many students in the early days were athletes. So this was a way to, to penetrate beyond that. It allowed me to look at the way race relations were at Michigan in the era of the early 20th century, when my grandmother was a progressive young woman teaching in Detroit and sort of forming the whole set of ideas about race that she would pass on to my, my father, my mother, and, and then to, to me and my siblings. It sounds convoluted, but I, I think that's real. What was it like to be an African-American student on the Michigan campus in the 1920s wasn't very much fun. And what was it like to be white students who made common cause with those students? That's, that's a personal story. My name doesn't appear. The, the, the word I does not appear in that story, but it's a story that comes out of me. There's a great, great sort of creative coach named Jessica Abel. She's a cartoonist and graphic novelist who got fascinated by podcasting and then wrote this book in graphic novel form about the great narrative podcasters. So her story is about storytelling, but it bridges all genres. Okay, so in that book, one of the things she says, a very simple thing, um, which I think she derives from Ira Glass of This American Life, advice to storytellers, pay attention to your attention. I'll repeat it, pay attention to your attention. That's what we've just been talking about. Why, why would the Negro Caucasian Club crossing my radar leap out at me? Yeah. Well, it's complicated, as we were saying, but it did. 
And in some ways, you don't even have to know why the, it, it speaks to you, why it reaches out to you and grabs you. you. But you have to pay attention to the fact that it does. Yeah. And take that seriously and realize that's what I want to write about. And so if you just look up and wonder, you know, then, then you're halfway there. That's great advice, not just for storytellers. It's good for all of us. Look up, you might see a little character peering out from an arch in the law quad. You might see a hawk making off with a squirrel, God forbid. Maybe you'll just see a squirrel making off with a piece of pizza. Or you might see a copy of Jim's book, Sing to the Colors, on a shelf at Literati. Such a great book, especially for alumni and parents who are missing the place after so many years. All right, so go get your book. We'll discuss. And until we meet again... Go Blue.